visit page at revive. Order it being 2 p.m. We'll proceed to questions without notice. Senator Wong. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, and they relate, it relates to the allegations of rape which have been made publicly. The alleged rape occurred on the evening of Friday the 22nd or morning of Saturday the 23rd of March 2019. On or before Monday the 25th, the Minister's office is made aware an incident took place. On Tuesday the 26th of March 2019, the Minister's then Chief of Staff, who currently works in the Prime Minister's office, meets with both the alleged rapist and Ms Higgins. Ms Higgins discloses the alleged rape. On Monday, the 1st of April, the minister finally meets with Ms Higgins. How can the minister maintain to the Senate and to the public that six days after Ms Higgins disclosed the alleged rape to the minister's chief of staff that she, the minister, still did not know? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for that question. Uh, like everybody in this building, I stand and I still stand ready to assist Brittany in any way that I can. And this begins and ends by allowing Brittany to guide this process, respecting her privacy and respecting the integrity of what is now a police investigation. She has indicated that she intends to pursue her complaint with the Australian Federal Police, and all of these matters go to the heart of that inquiry. Has the Minister, sorry, on the point of order. But I, I do make this point of order uh, that uh, it is, uh, if there is an active investigation, the minister should demonstrate that. If an investigation is under the way, underway, the minister should demonstrate how being upfront about the minister's conduct, how that would compromise the investigation, because that is the test. That is the test. I've allowed Senator Wong you to make the point. Senator Reynolds, have you concluded your answer? You have. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. What have you got to hide? What are you hiding? Order. Yeah. It's clearly it's so obvious you are hiding. I again ask, how can the minister maintain that six days after Ms Higgins disclosed the alleged rape to her chief of staff that the minister did not know? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said again, uh, at the heart of my and my chiefs of staff response to this matter has always been to seek the appropriate advice and to ensure that she was supported in whatever decision she made about her own life. Uh, this is, as I understand, now the subject and I of, of an active police investigation. Uh, it has always been an open investigation, is my advice, and order. I understand Senator, that Senator she Wong, is making a statement Wong on a from her order. public comments. Order. I have, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Order, and I raise my previous point of order. Is the minister assuring the chamber that she has knowledge of an active police investigation, and can she advise the chamber on what basis her being accountable for her conduct compromises that? Because that is the test, and anything less is you avoiding your order. accountability Senator to this Wong, place. Senator Wong, uh, I, Senator Reynolds, to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I really don't have much more to add to this. Uh, and order, order, order. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, S Senator I, Wong. I do not, I do not, in for a second, I do not for a second, resile from my determination to make sure that Brittany, that the staff member herself, is in control of the process. And that is the case. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. You didn't do the right thing. The minister has previously said any complaint of violence, verbal, physical or sexual, must always be taken seriously, particularly when, as members of parliament, we must be setting the standard for members of the community. Why has this minister so failed to meet her own standard? Why is she continuing the cover-up? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And all I can reiterate is, as I believe this is a subject of an ongoing AFP investigation, uh, that that is that is where that is where this matter rests. It is it is the right of the individual to control the process, Order. Order. which is why which is why which is why I referred 
I order. referred and facilitated I, I her Reynolds. meeting with the Australian Federal Police at the time because it was appropriate. I, I facilitated the meeting with the AFP with the member concerned. I, I, I have nothing order. further to add, Mr. President. Order, order on my left. Order, order. Senators on my left. Senators on my left, Senator Small has the call. Senator Wong. Order, Senator Gallagher. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Order. Can the Minister please update the Senate Order. on the Morrison Sorry, government's Senator Small, comprehensive Senator Small, plan? please, I'll give you a chance to start again. I can't hear the question. I didn't even hear quite to whom it was. Order. 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 Senator Order. Senator Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Payne. S Senator all senators. All senators. Senator Small, I ask you to recommence. Thank Senator you, Wong, Mr. Please. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister please update the Senate point on the order. Morrison government's comprehensive point, point plan oh, sorry, to roll point, out? Sorry, the Senator Small, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. I have been asked to withdraw an assertion that Senator Payne knew about the cover-up for two order. years. If she is telling us she didn't know, order. I withdraw, and I invite every other minister order. to make the same order. same Senator, ass assertion to the Senate Senator that they Wong. didn't know. Senator Wong, order. Order across the chamber. There are order. Order, everyone. Senator Small, you can start again. Thank you, Mr. President. A third time lucky. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister please update the Senate on the Morrison government's comprehensive plan to roll out the COVID-19 vaccines across Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Small, for your question. Rolling out the COVID vaccine across the country is one of the government's highest priorities, Mr President. 142,000 doses of the COVID-19 uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine arrived in Sydney Airport on Monday a major milestone in Australia's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first shipment out of 20 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine the government has secured as a part of COVID, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine treatment strategy. The country is on track for the first and most vulnerable Australians to start receiving the vaccine from Monday, Mr President. Approximately 80,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine will be released in the first week Approximately 50,000 vaccines will be made available for states and territories, for hotel quarantine and border workers and frontline healthcare workers. Approximately 30,000 vaccines will be made available for the Commonwealth Vaccine InReach workforce to aged care and disability care residents. It is expected that of these, at least 60,000 will be administered by the end of February with others to be continually administered thereafter, including to our most vulnerable uh, residents in more than 240 aged care facilities next week, Mr. President. Suppressing the virus, delivering the vaccine and cementing our economic recovery to create jobs are this government's highest priority. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how the targeted and phased rollout roadmap prioritises the most vulnerable Australians. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Small. Mr President, we have prioritised the most vulnerable people in our society to receive COVID-19 vaccine first. The most vulnerable include our frontline workers and our senior Australians. They will be part of Class 1A, as I have just outlined. It's on track to roll out next week. Phase 1B will include adults over 70 years and either healthcare workers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, 
younger adults with an underlying medical condition, including those with a disability and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire, emergency services and meat processing workers. Phase 2A Mr. President, includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 18 to 54 years and other critical and high-risk workers. Mr. President. Phase 2B expands to the remainder Order, of the Senator Australian Colbeck. population. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister also update the Senate on how the government is working particularly closely with aged care facilities to distribute the vaccines? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and, uh, the activation of the vaccination process into aged care is a significant logistic exercise for the government but also for aged care providers. Information has been sent out to aged care facilities for residents, their families, carers and loved ones about what to expect in the lead-up to and on vaccination day. Our clinical workforce will work very closely with each facility in the lead-up to, vac to vaccination day to make sure the day runs safely and efficiently. Clinical staff at facilities will check the health of residents prior to administering the vaccine and each residential aged care facility will ask residents and their substitute decision makers if there's one in place to consent to receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Mr President, I met with providers uh, and their representatives again this morning and engaged in a very active and, con and uh, constructive discussion with respect to the rollout. The rollout is a significant logistical exercise for all involved, and I want to thank Order. them Senator for their Colbeck, support and efforts for the to roll out has this expired. Vaccine. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. On Monday, the Minister said that in her meeting with Ms Higgins on 1 April 2019, that she was, and I quote, not aware of the details or the circumstances of the alleged incident in my office. When did the minister become aware and who told her? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much and thank, I thank the senator for the question. Uh, and as I indicated in my previous response, uh, it's my understanding that Brittany has indicated she intends to pursue her complaint with the Australian Federal Police and that she has asked for her privacy to be respected. And order, I will do Sorry, so. Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Point of order, just the information of the um, chamber. Ms Higgins has given um, permission for us to ask questions about this incident. Se Just for sorry. your information, I don't I'm think sorry. you should Senator hide Gallagher, behind Ms Higgins you to by refusing point. to answer it, it, these questions. A, technically a, a point of order. I'll call the minister to continue. Se Senator Reynolds has concluded. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Oh. In terms of the Prime Minister's office and their awareness, and I quote from the government's own statement, as part of this process, the Prime Minister's office provided support to Minister Reynolds and her office in assessing a breach of the statement of standards for ministerial staff by the other staff member involved in the incident. Can the minister explain in her own words what the nature of this support was? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the Prime Minister announced yesterday that these matters uh, the one that Senator Gallagher has referred to would be examined thoroughly, and I welcome and I support that process. What I will say, again, is that at all times my staff and I try to support Brittany. Uh, in order. Order. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Are you hiding? My supplementary, um, Mr. President, is. By whom was this support from the Prime Minister's office provided and why did the Prime Minister's office only provide support in relation to the alleged rapist? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and again, I'll just reiterate that the Prime Minister yesterday announced that these matters would be thoroughly examined and I welcome and I will support that process. Senator Reynolds has concluded her answer. Senator Wong. Um, Senator Reynolds has concluded her answer, I gather. Senator, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. Uh, the Prime Minister has said that he was not aware of the allegations made by Brittany Higgins until Monday and that his office didn't know until Friday last week, despite the involvement of two ministers and current senior staff in his office. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says he finds it very, very, very hard to believe that the PM's office was not aware. 
Yesterday, the PM also said he wanted to listen to Brittany, but then he questioned her report that she'd been contacted by his fixer, Euron Finkelstein. Do you agree with the former Prime Minister that it strains credulity that Mr Morrison's office did not know about the alleged rape? And do you support the Prime Minister's suggestion that Brittany was confused and wrong about contacts from Mr Finkelstein? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, in relation to uh, advice provided uh, to the Prime Minister's office, uh, it's important to appreciate uh, what Senator Reynolds has indicated previously, the respect for Brittany's choices and confidentiality. The primary concern is for Brittany and her welfare. And it's out of concern for Brittany and to empower her decision-making that Minister Reynolds facilitated discussions between Brittany and police in early 2019. I note, that, I note that parliamentary departments provided access to police with CCTV footage at that time and have preserved such footage to facilitate any future access. It's clear, obviously, from what has been said publicly, that Brittany believes the support ultimately was inadequate for which Minister Reynolds has unreservedly apologised. Concern for Brittany's wellbeing remains paramount, including her right to preserve her choices around whatever actions or steps that she takes. But the government will certainly continue to cooperate with any investigations undertaken. Order. Senator, I have Senator Waters on a point of order. Senator yes, Waters. a point of order on relevance, please, President. My question clearly went to whether um, the minister agrees with Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Turnbull's views. Um, and it pertains to whether or not he agrees that Brittany was lying. I, 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 Senator Waters, I remind senators again that when there is a, a, a long preamble, the minister can be directly relevant. That was a long question. The minister is clearly being directly relevant to the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. The Prime Minister has made clear his view that he believes he ought to have been notified earlier. Uh, but of course, as always, uh, how such notifications are handled in the future will be uh, a factor of consideration of the reviews that are underway, noting the fact that the privacy and confidentiality wishes of individuals also need to be respected uh, when such issues arise. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, uh, thanks, President. The bungled response to incidents around Brittany Higgins's assault has involved senior staff in the Prime Minister's office, two ministers, security guards, the presiding officers and the Department of Parliamentary Services. The government's fingerprints are all over this, and it's simply impossible to imagine that an in-house investigation will be adequate to get to the bottom of this. When will the government commit to an independent investigation into the response to Brittany Higgins's rape allegations? Senator Birmingham. Oh. Mr President, uh, the government and the Prime Minister committed yesterday to uh, a non-partisan, cross-party uh, review around workplace matters. And, uh, Senator, uh, I will be reaching out to you, as I will to others, uh, to ascertain the next steps in relation to how that review is undertaken. Senator Ward has a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Following the allegations aired on Four Corners last year, I wrote to both you and the opposition leader in the Senate requesting a cross-party meeting to discuss options to establish a robust, independent complaints procedure and to give staff confidence that allegations would be treated seriously and that there could be consequences for perpetrators. While I welcome the calls that are gaining some traction this week, why has it taken nearly three months and the most serious of misconducts in this building for the government to finally act and act in a weak manner? Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I don't accept uh, the final assertion there. I've just given an undertaking uh, that I will be engaging with Senator Waters, uh, with Senator Farrell or whomever the opposition nominates, uh, and indeed with others who wish to participate to ensure that the type of cross-party response uh, to uh, create uh, a stronger uh, set of practices in relation to workplace relations matters in this building for the future uh, is as comprehensive as it needs to be. And I look forward to engaging with those parties uh, to achieve that outcome. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Sasolja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is ensuring that Australian families and businesses have access to the affordable, reliable energy they depend on, which will support job creation and continue our economic recovery? 
the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Oh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Hughes for the question. Uh, the Order. Morrison government, unlike those opposite, uh, is focused on delivering affordable, reliable and secure electricity for all Australian families and businesses. This is central to our ongoing commitment to economic recovery and will support jobs, productivity and economic growth. And our plan to reduce power bills for hundreds of thousands of households and businesses is working. As a result of the default market offer reforms introduced by the Morrison government, Australians are already benefiting from lower electricity prices. Wholesale energy prices across the national electricity market have fallen for 17 straight months, from well before COVID, with wholesale costs making up around a third of residential electricity bills and even more for industry. Uh, these price falls are delivering real savings for Australian families and businesses. Today, the Australian Energy Regulator released its draft determination for the default market offer for 2021-22. Now, the DMO will translate into lower prices for households and businesses across New South Wales, South East Queensland and South Australia. The DMO caps, the DMO caps the price of the most expensive offers in the market, protecting consumers from high electricity prices. The Australian Energy Regulator's draft price determination released today will drop prices for households on standing offers by up to 7.9 per cent, or $136 a year, and small businesses by up to 8.5 per cent. This builds on substantial savings already delivered in the first two years of our default market offer reforms. Average residential customers who are on the highest standing offers prior to introduction of the DMO could now be up to $802 per year better off in New South Wales, $794 better off in South East Queensland and $707 better off in South Australia. We're putting more money into people's pockets and supporting our economic recovery. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on how all Australian families and businesses, including in my home state of New South Wales, can make sure they're getting the best energy deal? Senator Seselja. Well, thank you, and I can. The Morrison government remains absolutely focused uh, on providing relief to Australian households and business, and, I, and I'm pleased to advise the Senate that we are empowering consumers to find the best energy deals available. Now, while the default market offer protects customers from the highest priced offers, it's important that households and businesses understand there are better offers available. That's why we're not only encouraging customers to shop around for the best deal, but we are giving them the, teals, the, the tools to do so. So the government's Energy Made Easy website, energymadeeasy.gov.au, makes it easy for customers to compare all energy offers that are available in the market and to make the switch. We've also added new features to the website to make it even easier uh, to compare deals, including for solar feed-in credits. I'd encourage all energy customers, whether you're a household or a small business, to check out the website, review your energy policy and to find a cheaper power plan. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please advise how the Morrison government's approach is ensuring that energy remains affordable for small businesses, particularly in my home state of New South Wales, and is the minister aware of any risks to this approach? Senator Seselja. Thank you, Mr President. And yes, I am. Since we introduced the default market offer, the average small business in New South Wales could have saved up to $3,124 a year. Now, that is in stark contrast and would be put at risk by those opposite. Now, not, 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 not for a lack of trying from the Otis Group, who have absolutely done their best. Uh, you know, they've had some early wins where they managed to get rid of uh, Mark Butler as the energy spokesman, and they thought they were onto something. And well done, well done to Senator Farrell for that. Order. Only, only to Order. have him replaced by Chris. I love a carbon tax, Bowie. Order. Uh, so they get rid of Mark Butler, and then straight away they get hit with Chris Bowen. And to add insult to injury, Order. They, they have the spokesman for Queensland Resources is Murray White. Murray Watt, who's never seen a resource that he would ever want to be de see deployed in any energy source, be it in Queensland or elsewhere. We're getting on with the job. We're lowering energy prices Order. in Senator contrast Seselja, to those opposite. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. The Minister says she always wanted Ms Higgins to drive this process. If that is true, why has the minister failed to assure the Senate that neither she, nor her staff, nor any of the Prime Minister's staff 
said or did anything which may have encouraged Ms. Higgins not to pursue the incident with police. Will the minister now provide that assurance? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Yes. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. The minister says she has always wanted Ms. Higgins to drive this process. If that is true, why, as Ms. Higgins says, was the alleged rape, and I quote, a taboo thing it was never spoken about again? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Keneally for that question. Uh, and as I have observed uh, in this place over the last three days, that this process begins and ends with allowing her to guide this process, respecting her privacy and respecting the integrity of what is now a police investigation. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The minister says she has always wanted Ms Higgins to drive this process, but when asked about whether when Ms Higgins was asked whether she felt pressured in any way whatsoever not to proceed with the case to the police, Ms Higgins stated unequivocally, and I quote, absolutely, absolutely. Does the minister accept that Ms Higgins felt pressured not to proceed with her complaint to the police? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I'll refer back to my first answer uh, where I said yes. Senator Davey. Oh, oh, no, Senator. All right, I'll, I'll call the minister. Senator Reynolds. I, 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 this is, this, this, Mr. Mr. President, this is a critically important uh, point. I have been very, very, very consistent and said that this has always been about consulting Brittany Higgins and providing the advice to her and allowing her own agency to determine what she does. Order. Senator Keneally. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. I understand the minister got back to her up on her feet to attempt to answer the question, but she didn't actually address the question. It was, does she accept Ms Higgins felt pressure? I, I, it's not about what with, she did, it's about what does she with, accept. With, with respect, Senator Keneally, I, I cannot deem the minister's answer in any way not directly relevant. There's an opportunity after question time to debate questions. Um, Senator Reynolds, have you concluded or you wish to continue? Senator, Senator Reynolds. Uh, I cannot speak for anybody else and in this place. I, I speak and I'm accountable for my own actions. And as I've said, Order. at the beginning and the end of this process, it was about respecting her privacy and her, and her integrity and her wishes. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small, Biz Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister please outline how our government is supporting jobs in regional Australia as we emerge from bushfires, drought and now the COVID pandemic, and how this investment will support further job creation and continue our economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey uh, for her question, and I acknowledge the commitment of all of us on the government side of the chamber to rural and regional Australia. Uh, Mr President, supporting rural and regional Australia, in particular through the COVID-19 pandemic, has been a fundamental priority of the Morrison government. Our government has stood with rural and regional Australia through its most difficult times, and we are putting in place the right policies, the right investments to ensure that those in rural and regional Australia have that opportunity to emerge even stronger on the other side of COVID-19. When we look at the contribution of rural and regional Australia, uh, it produces our nation's most valuable export, it supplies our energy, and I think all of us in this chamber would agree. It certainly provides us here in Australia with some of our most attractive tourist destinations. When you look at the breakdown of the workforce, uh, Senator Davey, with over 32 per cent of the workforce is actually in New South Wales and over 50 per cent of the workforce in Tasmania and Queensland, they are actually located in our regions. And that is why our $74 billion job maker plan is such an investment in regional Australia 
and importantly, the creation of regional jobs. Because certainly uh, the Morrison government are all about putting in place the right economic policies so that all Australians, but in this case rural and regional Australians, are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. Mr President, research by the National Skills Commission, 51 per cent of the 260,000 resources jobs are in regional areas, and over 40 per cent of these workers they receive their qualification via vocational education and training. And again, that is why the government puts in place policies to support our communities, to support rural and regional Australia, to prosper, to grow, and to create more jobs for Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. And as part of our government's more than $7 billion investment in skills, how are the apprentice wage subsidies supporting a new generation of skilled workers throughout rural and regional communities? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, we acknowledge that skills and training they are critical to the manufacturing and the resources industries that drive so many of our economies uh, in these regions. The government's put in place, as we've spoken about before, the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy. And this has, of course, provided crucial support across Australia, but in particular in our regional areas, for their apprentices and the small businesses uh, that have those apprentices throughout COVID-19. In remote and regional Australia, the subsidy has actually helped keep over 41,000 apprentices and trainees in work and almost 22,000 small businesses. Without that subsidy, those apprentices and trainees may not have been able, Mr President, to be kept on the job. And Senator Davey, you'd be interested to know that in those figures that actually includes over 7,000 small businesses in your state of New South Wales. Again, the Morrison government putting in place the policies to keep our apprentices and our trainees where we Order, need them Senator on Cash. the job. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Now, while we've seen encouraging signs of economic recovery, what measures is our government putting in place to continue to support our regional econo economies to further recover and help drive our um, roadway out of the pandemic? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Davey, you'd be also interested to know that in terms of our boosting apprentices commencements wage subsidy, which of course is supporting that new generation, that new pipeline of skilled workers in Australia, to date around 23,000 new apprentice training contracts has been reserved under the program by almost 12,000 businesses. And where are they located, those businesses? In regional Australia. Again, the Morrison government putting in place the policies to ensure that our regional businesses, our rural businesses, have that capacity to keep those apprentices on the job where we need them. But of course, our investment does not stop there, Mr. President. We have a $100 million regional recovery partnership program. In terms of these par uh, partnership programs, we're going to supercharge um, and, the, and coordinate investments with other levels of government to support growth, prosperity in at least 10 regions across Australia. We are putting in place the suite of policies that businesses Order. need Senator to Cash, prosper, time grow, to and create has more expired. jobs. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Minister, through you, Mr. President, will you guarantee that people on the job seeker payment won't go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? The Minister for Social Services and Families, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Seawitt, for your, your question and, uh, and clearly a long going and enduring interest in. Uh, in those people that um, find themselves in the need of the receipt of welfare. Um, but one of the things I would say that, that has been very clear by this government is that um, we remain committed to walking side by side with all Australians as we work, walk our way through this pandemic. And we understand um, you know, that it has been a tremendously tough year for many Australians over the last 12 months as this pandemic has taken an unprecedented toll on our economy and our society, and particularly um, individuals who found themselves who lost their work. Um, but Senator, um, Senator Seawitt, one of the things that, that the government has been very clear about is that 
Our focus must, whilst helping and supporting people who find themselves in a situation where they are unemployed, our most important role now that the economy is starting to open up, we are starting to see uh, um, all of the, st the, the statistics and figures of an economic recovery, a jobs market recovery. We're seeing you know, um, renew or, or returned levels of job advertisements and, and job availability. That we must make sure that the efforts of the government are entirely focused on assisting people on the pathway back to work. And that's why the government has, has moved and transitioned much of our support uh, in terms of additional supports that are in the marketplace towards job creation and, and job access programs, like, for instance, the, the, uh, the hiring credits. Well, sorry, Senator Seward on a point of order. <laughs> Senator, uh, Mr President, a point of order. I asked no preamble, a very simple question. So could I please ask the minister, thank her for the information she's given us. Will she guarantee that the payment won't go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? Yes or no? I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question, Senator Seward. You did ask a very simple and precise question. Um, if the minister is talking about that particular payment, I do consider that to be directly relevant, but I've allowed you to remind her of the question. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and, but as I was saying, I mean, the, the point that I was making to, to Senator Seward in my answer, Mr. President, is the fact that we still remain in a situation where the COVID pandemic is impacting on our economy and on the response that the government is providing to the economy to support all Australians. And we believe that at the moment there are elevated levels of support that remain in place for people who find themselves unemployed Order, at Senator this Rustin. time. Senator Rustin, Senator Seward, a supplementary question. That is a no. Earlier this week, there were reports that you were, the government was considering simplifying the system and considering a flat rate for the job seeker payment. Today, we learn that the government might be consider, considering a so-called unemployment insurance scheme. Isn't this just a deliberate distraction from the fact that the job seeker payment is going back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I can categorically say no, it is not. Uh, and the other thing I would say in response to the, the question that you just put forward, or the commentary you just put forward, is that um, you know one thing I have learned very clearly around here is you don't speculate on speculation, uh, and that is clearly what you are currently doing. Um, there have there have been numerous commentaries around what governments do and don't do. I think probably the best thing to do is to wait and find out what government is doing when government actually does it. Uh, but what I would say to you, Senator. See, well, it is very clear um, that the, uh, the economy has been significantly affected, our jobs market has been significantly affected, and we have had a year, an unprecedented year of upheaval. But the government has made sure that we have stood side by side with Australians by providing additional support to those people who have found themselves out of work. Currently, we have an, a, an elevated support level for people who are unemployed of $150 uh, a, a fortnight. That goes through for, for another, uh, another uh, sort of six or or eight weeks. Um, but Order, we are Senator Rustin, time focused. for the answer has expired. Senator C, what a final Minister, supplementary question. Minister, you've just, you've just admitted that the effects of the pandemic are still going. You've said you're walking side by side with Australians uh, through this pandemic. What do you say to the thousands of people who are on Job Seeker today, right now, to the mothers, the fathers, the young people, the older people, about certainty, if you're so keen on walking side by side with them, what are you saying about certainty of a payment that's going to go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, well, Senator Seward, um, I won't repeat the answers I've given to my first, your, two, your first two questions, but I would say um, you know, the, the government has, has been stood with Australians who found themselves uh, unemployed over the last 12 months by providing a coronavirus supplement in recognition of the conditions in the jobs market at the time. Clearly, when we first went into the pandemic, the $550 supplement recognised the fact that the jobs market closed down overnight. But now, as we're seeing the economy starting to open, the jobs market starting to improve, we're very keen to make sure that our initiatives that we have in the marketplace are helping people to get back into work, helping jobs to be created through the programs that are being put in place, uh, you know, like the job trainer um, program that Senator Cash is, the working hiring credits that, that have been put in place for young Australians. Because the most essential thing that we can do to help people who are unemployed is to create jobs, help with business to create jobs and make sure they've got pathways to those jobs. Senator Green. 
Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Businesses in far north Queensland have made it clear to both the Morrison government and the opposition that JobKeeper is keeping businesses solvent and when, with its withdrawal, jobs will go. CEO Skyrail Ken Chapman said of job losses, and I quote, across the region it will probably be thousands, definitely hundreds. Why won't Mr Morrison be upfront with these businesses about what ongoing support will be available at the end of March? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, this is a matter, of course, that Senator Green has raised in the chamber previously, and I'm uh, pleased to add to uh, those uh, uh, responses I've uh, provided uh, in that context. Uh, in the last um, couple of weeks, uh, as uh, the Tourism Minister uh, has had the opportunity, uh, in fact, since his appointment, of course, uh, to meet with many tourism operators, many peak bodies, to understand the impacts of the pandemic and what pathways to recovery might look like. Specifically in relation to Queensland, Mr. President, most recently uh, the minister was able to visit regional Queensland. Uh, he participated in a series of roundtables. He met with tourism operators, with small businesses, with representatives of local industry. One of the reasons for that, Mr. President, of course, is because uh, members and senators on this side of the parliament believe it is important to meet directly with those business representatives and Order. to hear that feedback in person. Uh, for example, the minister held roundtables with exporters, with the tourism and aviation sector, uh, which were hosted by Order. Tourism Tropical North Queensland. He met with the CEO of the Star, Senator the theme park CEOs on the Gold Coast as well. Uh, he participated in uh, another meeting with Gold Coast tourism stakeholders. So he has had the opportunity to hear directly from those local tourist operators to understand how state border closures and the loss of international tourists particularly are impacting them. Uh, I think the minister has found that experience very valuable in terms of working so closely with the tourism sector in Queensland, uh, but also across Australia on a post-job keeper plan for tourism recovery. As a result of those discussions and many other engagements, uh, Mr President, the government is very conscious that JobKeeper has supported a large portion of the tourism industry. And, in fact, I myself have heard the positive Order. feedback Payne, from many operators about that expired. support. Senator, Senator Payne, the uh, order. time for the answer has expired. I was attempting to call order as well. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. Tourism operators in far north Queensland are crying out for certainty from this government, fearful of their jobs and livelihoods. When will the Morrison government make an announcement about what support will be available when JobKeeper ends? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As I was saying um, in my remarks in the uh, earlier response, the government is very conscious that JobKeeper has supported a large portion of the tourism industry. And so we are considering how best to support economic recovery in the tourism sector when JobKeeper does conclude uh, at the end of March this year. I would, however, also remind the Chamber, though, Mr President, that, as I have said previously, we have provided in the process of the response to the pandemic uh, and in the 2020-21 uh, budget, uh, a strong plan of support for the industry. That includes the $50 million for the recovery for regional oh, tourism sorry, fund Green, to boost to tell, tourism sorry, in Payne, nine regions. I have regions. Senator Green on a point of order. It's difficult to tell. My apologies, because the lectern. Senator Green. Point of order, Mr President. It's just on relevance. Uh, the question was very directly about when, when the Morrison government will make an announcement about support when JobKeeper ends. It's an incredibly important date Order. for these businesses that need Senator certainty Green, now. You, Senator Green, I've made, allowed you to make the point of the second part of your question. The minister is entitled to be directly relevant to any part of the question. Uh, if the minister is talking about the first part of the question, that is You're also directly now. relevant. Yeah. Senator Payne. I was going to respond further to the point of order, Mr President, but oh, um, you dealt with that, and so thank you very My much. Uh, that's all right, Mr President. I was speaking about, uh, well, let me say, in response to the point of order, that I did respond to that part of Senator Green's question uh, when I commenced my answer, that I did order, respond Senator to Payne, that. Senator Payne, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. As the Senator has mentioned, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment claimed that he was in Queensland last week to gather the information that he needs to target support to the industry. We already know that the sector is losing billions of dollars a month and hemorrhaging jobs. How much more information does the Minister need? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I can only imagine Mr. President, that if the minister did not meet directly with tourism representatives in North Queensland, on the Gold Coast, other parts of the state represented by Senator Green, and in other parts of Australia, I can only imagine, Mr. President, if the tourism minister did not do that, that those opposite would say he was negligent, that he was failing in his obligations to the sector. So the minister takes those very seriously, Mr. President. We absolutely understand the pressure order, and the impact order. of the COVID-19 pandemic on tourism on right in this too. country. We understand and our response reflects that. Whether it is the Recovery Senator for Watt. Regional Tourism Fund, whether it is the Building Better Regions Fund, whether it is the Regional Recovery Senator Partnerships Watt. Fund, whether it is the Business Events Grants Program or whether it is the Consumer Travel Support Program, Mr President, all of those initiatives Order. are Senator directed Payne. at supporting Time this vital sector which has, has struggled. Order on my left and right. Order. Senator Watt. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the importance of Australia standing with other countries to oppose the practice of arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson uh, for his uh, very important question. Mr President, one of the most powerful tools that we have to discourage countries from breaching their international obligations is speaking and working together to demonstrate a shared commitment to values and to goals. Early yesterday morning, very early Australian time, I joined colleagues from across the globe to endorse the Declaration Against the Use of Arbitrary Detention in State-to-State -state Relations, which has now been supported by more than 55 countries. The Australian government resolutely opposes the use of arbitrary detention, arrest and sentencing, including to influence state-to-state -state relations and exercise leverage over foreign governments. This is a malicious practice against international law. States' international human rights obligations include express obligations to foreign and dual nationals. In the declaration, we have highlighted the international rules, the norms and institutions that underpin stability and prosperity, human rights and enable global cooperation. I want to acknowledge the particularly strong leadership of Canada as well on these issues. The past year, I've been working very closely with former Foreign Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne and more recently with his uh, successor, Foreign Minister Marc Garneau, including to gather international support for speaking collectively against these practices and protecting the interests of our citizens. We'll continue to discuss areas of future cooperation with counterparts, as I did this morning in my conversation with US for, for, um, Secretary, uh, uh, Foreign Secretary Raab. Australia's support for the declaration builds on a joint statement on politically motivated arbitrary detention delivered on behalf of 35 countries at the 45th session of the Human Rights Council in October. We will continue to advocate strongly for our citizens and others who are subject to arbitrary detention. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how bringing attention to the practice of arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations is in the interests of Australians and their safety overseas? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. At any time, uh, as uh, parliamentarians uh, know as part of their daily work, Australian officials are dealing with many complex consular matters around the world, and every single case is different. Australia observes rules that apply to foreign nationals here within our jurisdiction and extends appropriate domestic protections. We expect all other countries to do the same. We'll always call for our citizens to be accorded justice and procedural fairness in line with international norms. And Australia will hold countries to account for their international commitments and their obligations to comply with international law and practices. There must be a cost imposed for states 
who subject the citizens of other nations to arbitrary attest, arrest Order. and detention. Noting that international travel is restricted Order. because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we do strongly urge all Australians to monitor advice in relation to these matters on the Order. Smart Traveller Senator website. Payne. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how Australia is advocating to ensure COVID-19 is not used as a pretext to erode human rights protections? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for that supplementary question. Australia has been consistently maintaining that the COVID-19 pandemic should not be used as a pretext for reducing or removing access to either justice or to consular assistance for people in detention. Indeed, on 24 March last year, I made a statement expressing particular concern for the health, the safety and the well-being of Australians detained overseas during the pandemic in a number of countries. Further, we, as we said in our contribution to the UN Human Rights Council last June, we have condemned the abuse of emergency measures or the imposition of rule by decree to undermine human rights, to subvert democratic or judicial processes, to contribute to disinformation and to target opponents. I know these issues are of significant concern to the Australian community. I want to thank my colleagues uh, from across this chamber for their ongoing engagement. Before I come to you, Senator Watt, I'd like to draw to the attention of senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Austria to Australia, His Excellency Mr Wolfgang Lucas Strohmeyer. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Parliament, but in particular to the Senate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. I refer to reports that in October 2019, following media inquiries into an alleged assault at Parliament House and in preparation for estimates hearings with the Australian Federal Police, the minister left Ms Higgins a voicemail message in which she said, and I quote, Daniel has got everything under control. I promise you. Can the minister advise the Senate what her office had under control? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And can I just say that, like all of us in this chamber, I am absolutely devastated uh, by, by what Brittany has gone through. Brittany was a valued member of my team for more than a year and a half. Senator Watt, in October 2019, a journalist made a media inquiry that involved Br Brittany and her previous employment. When Brittany discussed this matter with my Chief of Staff and I, she made it very clear that the matter had been dealt with at the time seven months previously. She did not want to discuss the matter and she did not want the matter taken any further. Her focus was on her distress at the journalist's inquiry and ensuring that at all times her own privacy was respected. We respected her wishes for privacy. But I made it very clear to her if she needed anything, she could always come to us. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When did the minister become aware that an alleged rape took place in Minister Reynolds' office in March 2019? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I only recently became aware, in fact, in relation to the alleged rape, it was when a journalist contacted my office for comment. On Friday the 5th of February, Brittany and I spoke and she disclosed details of what had occurred. I told her I wanted her to stay in her role and I would do anything to assist her, including relocating her position to Queensland if she wished. I offered to go directly to the AFP with her so that she could provide them with a statement. I said I would sit with her while she did this. She advised me she did not want to pursue it. I also offered to go to the Prime Minister's office with her to raise the issue directly with them. She said no. She advised me that at all times she wanted her privacy respected. I told Brittany that I would reluctantly accept her resignation, but I made it very clear from her. I was there for her, and if she needed anything 
All she had to do was ask. Senator White, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I appreciate the minister answering these sensitive questions. How did the minister become aware of the allegation of rape, and with whom did she discuss this issue? What action did she then take? Senator Cash. I believe that I did just answer that question. I've provided you with the date. I discussed it with Brittany, and she advised me of what she wanted. I offered to go directly to the Australian Federal Police with her. I offered to sit down with her while she made a statement. She said she did not want the matter pursued. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr uh, President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin. What is the Morrison government doing to ensure families can give their children the best possible start in life? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator McLaughlin, for what I think is one, probably one of the most important questions you could ask, and that is you know, how do we support our children and make sure that we have well-functioning fa families to ensure that that support is able to be delivered? Uh, because we know that children's, children's development and their growth is so important to what happens to them later in life. Each year, the federal government invests more than $260 million in early interventions and prevention services under families and children's Order. activity and family mental health support services. Order, As Senator a government, Ford. the programs we invest in are about giving children the best possible start in life. Early support for families plays a really important role in making sure that we, we support and prevent families from family breakdown, child neglect, family violence, substance abuse, mental illness and, of course, making sure that the transitioning of young children into school is the highest possible priority uh, for any child. The flow-on effects of this are really very clear. Uh, it builds protections and skills and resilience in our young people so that they can go off uh, into their life and we can avoid intergenerational disadvantage, which is so, so important. And intensive family support programs are one example of the kind of programs that we, we have been targeting. Early intervention programs we know reduce child neglect by working intensively with vulnerable families uh, to improve parenting capabilities. On top of this, obviously, um, our childcare subsidy is a very, very important part to help working families make sure that they are in a position to be able to access early learning opportunities for their children. We are listening to providers and working collaboratively to make sure that we achieve the outcomes for our children that we'd like to see. We know longer term ongoing funding is absolutely critical to future planning. And over the next five years, we will invest more than $1.2 billion. Uh, a major task we are now undertaking is the development successor for the national framework Order, protecting Senator Australia's children. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, Minister. I think there's a program uh, called HIPPI, which is helping prepare children. How is it doing so to improve their learning outcomes? Senator Rustin. Correct. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And yes, I can confirm, Senator Wong, Wong, it is a Brotherhood of St Lawrence program, and it has been amazingly successful. Um, and the most important thing about this program, which goes very much to my heart, and I know it goes to Senator McLaughlin's heart, is that it's, it's focusing on giving the same sort of opportunities for children that live in the regions uh, as those that in, in metropolitan areas, because we want to make sure every child in Australia has access to the opportunity of being able to have the best possible start in life. And in my home state, or our home state, uh, Senator McLaughlin of South Australia, we're really proud of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence program, the HIPPI program, and what it's achieving on the ground. In fact, last week they launched two amazing reports that show the success of the program um, since it's been in place uh, from the Murray Bridge Centre uh, and delivering programs in the Murraylands. And can I thank the member for Barker who represented me last week whilst I was in quarantine, unfortunately and unable to attend. But the HIPPI program recognises the importance in rural communities Order, Senator Rustin. Children. Time for the answers expired. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Minister, for regional families and children, what specific programs are helping to get kids and their parents ready for school? Senator McLaughlin. Well, oh, sorry, um, Senator Rustin. Sorry. Oh, did you? 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mr. President. Well, um, Senator McLaughlin, I mean, this hippie program is an absolute classic example of the kind of program that is absolutely focused on uh, in our regional, rural, uh, regional and rural communities. Um, it is a two-year home-based parenting and early childhood learning program. Uh, and it, what it does is it seeks to support parents and carers of young children uh, aged between four and five so that they can actually um, assist in the, the learning of those children, sort of like the child's first teacher. Uh, but what it is, is about is about intervening early to make sure that we are assisting in the growth and development of young children to make sure that the circumstances of a child do not impede their, uh, their growth or their readiness for school, because we know that young children when they first start school, if they are in a position to be school ready at that time, end up being advanced much more quickly than those children Order, start Senator with Rustin. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. A spokesman for the Prime Minister's office said, and I quote, as part of this process, the Prime Minister's office provided support to Minister Reynolds and her office in assessing a breach of the statement of standards of ministerial staff by the other staff member involved in the incident. Can the minister explain what this support from the Prime Minister's office entailed? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, uh, Senator Reynolds has indicated uh, she acted in accordance with advice from Ministerial and Parliamentary Services, uh, advice, in relation, advice in relation to uh, the interpretation uh, of uh, the ministerial code uh, would have been just that advice into the interpretation of the ministerial code. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. When and by whom was this support provided, and why was the support to Mr. Minister Reynolds' office limited to the alleged rapist? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, the uh, the advice. Uh, I would imagine was it provided uh, in the period uh, leading up to the termination of employment. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. We know that in March 2019, the Prime Minister's Office provided the Minister's Office with support. The Prime Minister's fixer was broadly in proximity following the alleged rape and contacted Ms Higgins in the week after Four Corners aired its Inside the Canberra Bubble expose. The Minister's then Chief of Staff had previously worked for and currently works for the Prime Minister. How can anyone believe the Prime Minister when he says neither he nor his office knew of the alleged rape until Order. this week? Senator, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I refer to the statements of the Prime Minister on the matter and ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Um, Mr. Senator Birmingham. Senator Birmingham. If we're going straight to taking vote, I think. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Wong? Yes, uh, I write, rise to take note of answers given by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, and I begin by reminding senators of an important statement. Any complaint of violence, verbal, physical or sexual, must always be taken seriously, particularly when, as members of parliament, we must be setting the standard for members of the community. This was a statement made by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, in June 2018. Senator Reynolds was expressing what I think we all agree is the standard the community expects. But standards only matter if they are upheld, and that is the test. Because when you claim to have standards that you don't act on, you send a signal. The signal you send is this, that there really are no standards, that there are no consequences, not for those who engage in violent acts, not for those who fail to take violent acts seriously. This week, this, the community has not seen the standard it, it expects met at the highest level of the government. Indeed, Senator Reynolds has had the opportunity to lead by example. And I compare her behaviour in this place and her actions previously uh, with the response that we had from Minister Cash today, who was prepared to stand and speak of her offer of support 
to report this matter to police, who were offered to sit with the complainant when doing so, and did not refuse to answer questions in this place about what she did. Instead, Senator Reynolds did not lead by example, and she let a woman down badly, a woman to whom she had a duty of care. Because we know from the courageous public testimony from Ms Higgins this week that she did not feel supported when she told her minister she had been raped by a colleague. Ms Higgins says she was given the choice as to whether she was going to give up on her career. She was told by her superiors she could go to the police, but they also added, we need to know ahead of time, we need to know now. She said she realised this alleged act of sexual violence in the minister's office was being seen as a, quote, political issue, end quote, a political problem. She said she realised, my job is on the line. So rather than give up on her dream job, she agreed to be sent to Western Australia where she was just alone. It was really hard. And so where was Senator Reynolds while Ms Higgins was struggling through this? Well, I, I will use Ms Higgins' own words to describe that. She did all, sort of actively try and avoid me as much as possible. She didn't like me coming to her event. She didn't like me going to things with her. I think I made her uncomfortable. And Senator Reynolds never again raised with Ms Higgins the alleged rape in her office. In Ms Higgins' words, it was this taboo thing. It was never spoken about again. Eventually the trauma of the alleged rape and its handing left Ms Higgins feeling she had to leave the workplace. But less than a year before that alleged rape in her office, when some Liberal women parliamentarians said they had been bullied over the Liberal leadership, Senator Reynolds stood in this place and said, some of the behaviour I simply do not recognise and I think has no place in my party. I cannot condone what has happened to some of my colleagues. I do not recognise my party at the moment. Well, I think many Australians will find those words jarring, to say the least, given Senator Reynolds' actions. Anyone who has read the reporting by Samantha Maiden and others about the wrenching ordeal Ms Higgins has gone through, anyone who watched Ms Higgins' interview with Lisa Wilkinson can see in her face and hear in her words the painful consequences. These are the consequences of standards not being upheld. It is not Ms Higgins who has not upheld the standards, but it is Ms Higgins who has paid the consequences for the actions and failures of others. Failures of the Prime Minister, failures of Minister Reynolds, the Minister who is responsible for the defence of the nation. So, Mr President, I ask this. What are the consequences for Minister Reynolds? Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. The matters raised here today are, of course, uh, uh, very, very concerning, um, and the, uh, we just can't imagine what uh, Ms Higgins must be going through, uh, particularly considering the, uh, the fact that these issues are um, being discussed by us all, and they're obviously very private issues for her. Um, but it's, uh, it is very important that things do change. Uh, there is no doubt about that. There is a, a sensitivity, though, that must be observed uh, when we're talking about such issues. And uh, the Prime Minister has said that the government takes these matters very, very seriously, uh, very seriously, that all matters of workplace safety must be taken seriously, and that anyone that works here in this place uh, whether they're working for a member of government or they're just part of the staff uh, that help run uh, this magnificent uh, facility and institution, uh, everyone that comes into this place that works, whether they're here or in electorate offices around the country, that they feel that they are working in a safe workplace. Uh, the reports of the alleged sexual assault in 2019 in the Prime Minister's office are deeply distressing. Throughout the entire process, the overriding concern of the government has always been to support Ms Higgins' welfare in whatever way possible. However, it's clear that more needs to be done. And the Prime Minister has announced, uh, both yesterday uh, in answers to questions at a press conference and also uh, in the other place today in answering to questions, 
uh, the process that uh, he has put in place now to ensure that there is a, a thorough uh, process that has gone through to uh, establish uh, whatever necessary changes are necessary within, uh, within practices and within procedures. Uh, the Prime Minister has asked uh, my good friend and colleague from Western Australia, Celia Hammond, the member for Curtin. Celia was previously uh, Vice-Chancellor of Notre Dame and has had to deal with many situations uh, or situations in, in their own institution there when she was Vice-Chancellor. Uh, she's very well established and, and someone that is uh, highly respected uh, that is going to be uh, working on a process uh, and she'll be working with MPs uh, in the government to identify ways that standards and expectations and practices can be further improved. Uh, further to that, uh, Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Now, I, I sit on the um, uh, on committees and in estimates when uh, uh, Ms. Foster uh, presents. And uh, while I don't know her personally, certainly seeing uh, the way that she conducts herself through estimates and through uh, committees, she is uh, an outstanding, outstanding official. And and is thoroughly independent in the way that she works. And I've got no doubt that the role that she will play in undertaking a review uh, and advising the Prime Minister on how processes can be improved, uh, that she will do uh, an outstanding job and will uh, ensure that, uh, that, that every avenue that needs to be explored will be. And I think the parliament uh, can be confident in that because I know that she is someone that is respected on, on all sides. Uh, when she undertakes this role. Uh, we understand that this is a matter that is under police investigation and, of course, uh, must respect that and, and follow uh, the necessary processes to ensure that that remains uh, um, consistent and that uh, there is no prejudice of that, uh, of that procedure, uh, uh, that undertaking at all. Uh, this is an important step that the government has consistently supported from the outset and, and we will of course, await the, the outcome of that, uh, of that process. Uh, we, as a country, are dealing with, with many things. We've got, we've got uh, the nation dealing with the, the COVID pandemic uh, and the, the, the ramifications of that. Uh, there was a question asked by Senator Green uh, that uh, asked a question about uh, the impact of JobKeeper and you know, I'd rather be taking our time here now uh, actually talking about the, uh, the, the impact uh, that JobKeeper uh, has had and, and, and the impact that that's had in protecting jobs. In my home state of Western Australia, uh, some 350-odd uh, thousand jobs were saved and protected uh, as a result of that program. I wish I could have actually spent my time today talking about the impact of that because that is, the, uh, that is what we know in Western Australia has had Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Like so many Australians, I am shocked and appalled by the revelations of the past few days that a young woman, a ministerial staffer, had suffered, was traumatised by an alleged rape in the minister's office on the minister's couch. It is shocking to even utter those words in the Australian Parliament in 2021. Feeling sick to my stomach, as I know so many Australians will be, at this news of a woman who, so excited, full of idealism, to come and work in the nation's parliament, to be so discarded so diminished, so ignored and left so alone after this alleged rape by the very people she came here to support and promote. That there is still a culture in this country and most disturbingly in this parliament. And it pains me to say, but after story after story of allegations of bullying and sexual assault in the Liberal Party, that there's a culture clearly that does not respect women. A culture that does not respect women, does not support them, does not believe them. This is completely unacceptable. And I think we need to examine that when the Prime Minister took over from Malcolm Turnbull, he, in response to those allegations of bullying, promised a robust process to ensure, a robust process, he announced, to ensure that these allegations would be taken seriously. Another announcement, no delivery. That robust process has not been delivered. 
The Prime Minister would also have us believe that his office only found out about this alleged horrific crime, a sexual assault, a rape of a staffer in his government that his office apparently only found out last week. It strains credulity, as Malcolm Turnbull said. It strains credulity, the claim of the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. We know that the then Chief of Staff to Linda Reynolds previously worked for Scott Morrison and is now back working for Scott Morrison. We know from Ms. Higgins' own evidence, her own testimony on national television that the Prime Minister's principal private secretary was around the office, involved in the conversations, was helping fix and manage the problem, and that's how Ms. Higgins described it, that she felt like she was a problem to be managed, she felt like she was a political problem to be sent away, that she felt absolutely felt pressure to choose between her job in the Morrison government or seeking justice for her alleged rape. The Prime Minister would have us believe that no one in his office knew about this alleged rape until that last week. The government's own statement last week, after, this week, the government's own statement this week after Ms. Higgins' interview says that the Prime Minister's office was involved back in March of 2018, 2019, assisting Minister Reynolds' office with this particular incident. So which is right, the government's statement or the Prime Minister's statement in the parliament? They can't both be right. This is a Prime Minister who does not like accountability, does not like transparency, and does not deliver. But here he has failed to deliver in the most extraordinary way, letting down every woman, every person, who works in this building and letting down women right across Australia because this Prime Minister stood up and said it only became clear to him the gravity of this situation when his wife reminded him that he had daughters. You don't have to be a man with daughters to understand that rape is a violent crime, an assault on a woman, it should be taken seriously, she should be supported, and it should be thoroughly investigated. All across Australia, people shook their head in confusion as to how the Prime Minister of this country could not just respond as a human being. The Prime Minister, the Minister for Defence, and the Morrison government continue to compound Brittany's trauma Thank by you, not Senator getting their story Your time straight. Has expired. Uh, Senator Small, I believe. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And it's, uh, it's tough. It really is tough to confront the circumstances in which uh, you know, this parliament as a whole finds itself in the wake of these revelations. I come to this place as a new senator and a new senator who has previously worked in, in the private sector for quite some time where rightly the focus is on the health, the safety and the security of all employees, because as Australians we rightly expect the right to be safe in the workplace. From the Prime Minister down, I think the response that we've seen this week from the government has been one aimed at upholding that very fundamental position. So the reports that uh, we've been dealing with relating to uh, the events of 2019 are rightly felt, I think, not only by the people in this place but the people of Australia to be deeply distressing. Throughout uh, you know, the entire process, however, I think it is obvious to any fair-minded person that the overriding concern has been to support Ms Higgins, to empower Ms Higgins and, rightfully, to respect the privacy of Ms Higgins. That said, as much as the government's response has uh, thus far been made clear, it is also clear that more is to be done. 
The Prime Minister has immediately undertaken that we will undertake two separate inquiries aimed at addressing the culture and the environment of work in this place. The fact that Celia Hammond, the member for Curtin, a previous Vice-Chancellor for the University of Notre Dame, who has long and extensive experience of managing these sorts of issues in an institutional setting. Because let's not forget, Madam Deputy President, that these are not partisan political issues, but these are fundamentally human issues. So the fact that we have an inquiry led by the member for Curtin aimed at ensuring that the standards and expectations, the practices and the processes in this place can be improved is something that I think we all take heart from. Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of PM and C, will also be undertaking a review. And this could, it could include referrals to the Finance Department, obviously at arm's length from the partisan politics of the day. In relation to this, the Prime Minister has been clear that we shouldn't presume for the conclusions of those reviews. Indeed, we should be focused on ensuring that the people that work in this place get the support that they need, even in the most of extreme circumstances, as has clearly been the subject of matters exposed this week. In, uh, in, in relation to all aspects of employment, and that includes the terrible events that we've had to confront, there needs to be a change. The Prime Minister has been clear about that. But that will be a matter of good faith inquiry, which the government has committed to. The Prime Minister himself has committed to ensuring that that will be the outcome that this government upholds. In that spirit, we saw the Minister for Defence unreservedly apologise to Ms Higgins. Minister Reynolds was, in fact, the first woman to achieve the rank of brigadier in the Army Reserve. Today we heard from Minister Cash. Minister Cash, despite being a trailblazer in industrial relations legal practice before coming to the Senate, has also been the minister assisting the Prime Minister for Women and the Minister for Women. That was a heartfelt moment that we saw today, frankly, and I think that it goes to the heart of the fact that on this side of the chamber we seek only to uphold the dignity, the privacy and the integrity, the rights of those who come to work in this place with the very legitimate expectation of staying safe. So I think it is clear that the government's response is aimed only uh, at the right things and that we will abstain from any involvement in, in party politics. The reviews undertaken are non-partisan across parliament and aimed at absolute integrity. We can do better. We must do better. We have been clear about that, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes. Thank, thank you, Madam you, Deputy Senator President. Senator Small. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'd like to focus my comments uh, today on answers given by Senator Reynolds uh, to questions asked of her uh, by the opposition. And it, those uh, questions go directly to the conduct of this minister. And the conduct of this minister is something that she has to be accountable for in this chamber. And what we have seen over the last three question times is the minister, after being a bit shaky on her feet with the details and not really knowing how to answer on Monday, take the decision, probably under advice by others, to not answer any questions at all and hide behind two defences. One, using Ms Higgins as a defence that Ms Higgins' privacy needs to be respected now that it's inconvenient for the Minister yep. for Defence. And the second one is this notion that there's an ongoing police investigation, which to my understanding hasn't been confirmed. I understand there is an open investigation. But the conduct of this minister is a legitimate avenue of questions by members of this place and deserves serious answers by the Minister for Defence. As Senator Wong and Senator Keneally have said, this goes to one of the most senior officers in this place about allegations of a most serious crime occurring in this building. To someone 
who came to work here. And whilst we accept that there are matters that may be subject to potential to police investigation in the future, there are matters which aren't, and those matters go to the conduct of this minister. When did she know? What did she do? How did she respond? And that is what she's avoiding in this place. And that leaves us, it can only leave us, with two explanations. One, that she's not being accurate in her comments to this chamber or deliberately not providing information. Or two, that she was willfully negligent in her role as an employer and as a minister. That is the only explanation we can be left with because we saw Minister Cash provide more information, frankly, in one question than we've had from Senator Reynolds in many questions. There is absolutely no legal constraint on Senator Reynolds telling this chamber when she became aware, what she did when she became aware and what steps she took to support Ms Higgins. She tells us she did, but she doesn't explain what she did. It is not unreasonable to put those questions to the Minister for Defence. She is a senior minister in this place and there are very public allegations about a serious crime occurring not only in her suite but in her office on her couch. She cannot hide behind Ms Higgins any longer. She deserves better. So the language she uses about wanting to support Ms Higgins, she can support her by being truthful about what happened. Because by withholding information, what she is, is continuing is the cover-up that has been underway for two years and is the cause of much trauma to Ms Higgins. It's the cover-up often that is as much as, as, as traumatic as other elements of a serious crime like this because it compounds the trauma and it means that people she worked for, she looked up to, she, you know, that she expected to be treated properly and she hasn't been. And Senator Reynolds does nothing to dissuade us from that, from that view, nothing, by not answering. We know, and it's on the public record, that Ms. Reynolds, Senator Reynolds, Chief of Staff, knew after Ms Higgins disclosed on the Tuesday, I think the 25th of March, 2019, what had happened to her. On the 1st of March, oh, the 1st of April, Senator Reynolds is in a meeting with Ms Higgins. What happened in that six days? What happened? And why can't Senator Reynolds tell us? Because that is the missing link of some of what we have asked. And she is willfully withholding that information from the Senate. She is hiding behind a police investigation and she's hiding behind Ms Higgins. The Senate deserves better. Ms Higgins deserves better and, frankly, I think the rest of Australia Thank believes you, the Defence Minister of this country should provide that information. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from uh, Minister Rustin to the question I asked on the job seeker payment. Well, here we are, 42 days out from when the job seeker payment goes back to just $40 a day, a rate that the government knows very well is insufficient because they knew there was an urgent need to double it with the coronavirus supplement when the pandemic hit, because they knew that people can't survive or couldn't, when they made that decision, survive on $40 a day. Well, they still can't survive on $40 a day. But when I asked, would the government guarantee that people on the job seeker payment won't go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April. She told us some information, but she would not say yes or no. The fact is, is that people cannot survive on $40 a day, that the government is subjecting people to uncertainty about their future, and that is unten untenable. What are people going to do in 42 days' time? Now, the government this week has been floating some balloons about what they might do about our income support system. There's the one about how we might simplify the system, that there's so many supplements that we might simplify the system. 
And some more cynical of us think that that's an, that will be an excuse to actually not significantly increase the job seeker payment. But then today we hear of the so-called employment insurance scheme, which some proponents would suggest would put 1 per cent on the Medicare levy to pay for it, which would create a two-tiered system in this country, which would cut people at six months, which would significantly impact on, long on the long-term unemployed, would significantly impact on young people, would significantly impact particularly on older workers who are constantly suffering from age discrimination and finding it hard to find work. But the underpinning of all this is the government and the minister kept talking about, well, we're trying to encourage people into jobs. Well, at the moment, there's 1.3 million people unemployed. And at the end of January, there was 129,000 jobs. You tell me how 1.3 million people fit into 129,000 jobs. They don't. So the jobs aren't there for people to be able to apply for, for people to be able to find work. And that is still going to be the case on the 31st of March. The jobs won't be there. So it does make me think that the governments floating these various ideas with their favourite media people, oh, we might simplify the system. Oh, there's the unemployment insurance scheme. All muddy the waters when the, when the focus needs to be on the fact that on the 1st of April, an un totally unfortunate day for the government, to be then letting people know, perhaps, that they're going back to $40 a day. Why can't the government guarantee oh, that, that job seekers will not be going back to $40 a day? Because people cannot survive on that. They actually need to be immediately letting those people that are looking for work know that they won't be dropped back to $40 a day, that in fact they will be increasing the job seeker payment and increasing the job seeker payment so that people no longer have to live in poverty. Because the government still don't seem to get, no matter how much evidence is presented, that poverty is a barrier to work. That is what stop also help stops people being able to find work. When you're having to spend all day, if you haven't got a home because you can't afford it because you're living on $40 a day, you're working out where you're going to be sleeping the night, you're homeless, if you can't put food on the table, if you can't meet your medications, if you can't go to the dentist, all those things that people are saying they've been able to afford when the coronavirus supplement came in and doubled JobSeeker. We need to be making sure that Australians and people that are on the, people that are on the job seeker payment aren't living in poverty on $40 a day. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe.